All right. I call this uh, meeting to order at 6.39 p.m. on September 19th, 2022. Can I have the roll call, Wendy? Chair Cronenberger? Here. Vice Chair Gabriel? Here. Board Member Addison? Board Member Alcorn? Here. Board Member Field? Present. Board Member Geddes? Here. Board Member Henderson? Here. Chair, we have quorum. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to now have everybody stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I want to make just one note. I am in the process of having cataract surgery. Uh, left eye's done, right tomorrow. I can only see about two feet. So everything is blurry here. So be, please be uh, gentle. gentle with me. But I have read everything in the packet to uh, nausea, as, as Ashley knows I do. So anyway, um, can I have approval? Are there any changes to the agenda? And if none, any? None? Okay, the agenda is approved. Uh, do I have an motion for the minutes? Approval of the minutes. I move to approve last month's minutes. Anybody have any comments on the minutes? I'll second. Any comments on the minutes? Just one typo. Oh, don't worry about the typo. Okay. Okay, all right. Okay. Uh, can I have a vote for approval of the minutes? Let's see now. Vote, vote, vote. Press that. And press. Chair, I Chair. am actually going to ask um, Board Member Geddes because obviously if there is a typo in the minutes, that's the reason we approve them, so what the typo is. Oh, okay. All right, Chris. I believe in them. Um, Rapaho is misspelled. It doesn't have the E on the end. And I don't have a copy in front of me. I apologize. Or if somebody has a copy, they can uh, pass yeah. to me. Uh, on page two, uh, for a house in Arapahoe Hills, and then Arapahoe Acres on page three. Yes, so Arapahoe Hills does not have the E on it, and Arapahoe Acres does. Wow, excellent. Thank you for finding that, Jason. I think that's true. I think Arapahoe Hills doesn't have an E. Right. Yeah. But Arapahoe Acres does not have the E on the end, and it should. Acres is different than Hills. Okay, so purely typographical, nothing yes. substantive. Yes. Okay, yeah, thank that's you. what I was. I appreciate it. There was a typo. Thank you. Okay. Any more? Do you want us to move again? No, we'll, we'll just take the vote. So. Did you press this? I did. Let's see, press that. Oh, there it is. There it is. Where's open on here? Seven to vote. Seven to vote. Did that, did, did that. that. Did this. And did that. Okay, yeah, do that. Did that. Ready to vote. Ready to press ready. Then to press vote. open. You didn't press ready to vote. There we go. Oh, I didn't. Okay. It's not very sensitive. <laughs> okay. Okay. K 
Kim hadn't voted yet. I have to... I have to reject it. Okay. I get it. Okay. Mm -hmm. I have nothing. They've got nothing. Ah, now I've got it. Okay. Oh, that's right. Okay. Okay. The vote is six in favor. The motion carries unanimously. Okay. Now it's time for public comment. If you wish to address the board under public comment, okay. please sign in on the public speaker before and before the call to order of this meeting. Each speaker will be limited to three minutes. The board is not authorized by the Colorado Open Meetings Law to discuss, comment, or take action on a meeting on any issue raised by the public that is not part of tonight's agenda. The chair may refer the matter to staff to obtain additional information and report back as appropriate. We have one person on the um, public comment meeting, Pam Chor Chanborn. Good evening, Historic Preservation Board. I'm Pam Chanborn. I live a block and a half from here. So I've been uh, watching Queen Elizabeth II's funeral events, and that's historic preservation. Um, so uh, I'm going to come off of that and say a few things. Uh, first, I support the recommendation of state income tax credit for rehab of 5455 South Mohawk. They're actually straight west of my house, pretty much. Um, I want to thank staff for the painstaking work to assess the work that was done and assure that each is qualified. And I want to thank the Olsons for undertaking this restoration. It isn't easy to do. Um, but this is a great mid-century modern home, and it strengthens the Arapahoe Hills District, which, by the way, does not have an E, I believe. And so um, it's great to do this. Um, second, Geneva Lodge, please. Um, uh, we need to preserve it, and the idea of applying for a state historic fund grant is great. Um, I'd be cautious about the changes. I don't like the changes to city center. Nobody joined me in this, but I don't like moving the entry. That's the wrong answer. And nobody on historic preservation board spoke up against it. Um, so I'm concerned, and I hope you um, guard the changes that are done to Geneva Lodge. Restoration of original doors sounds great. Replacing non-historic window sashes sounds odd, and you recently had a study session about that. So um, please protect Geneva Lodge. It's good to get a grant and restore it, uh, but be careful about what <laughs> the city does. Um, in the study session, I want to thank Gail Keeley for persevering on her adventurous path to find a way to preserve the Canary Barn. Awesome. Few other citizens could have done this, and the future city will be grateful. This is a great thing. Um, but at the same meeting, the HLI annual meeting, I heard that Andrea is leaving. And um, I'm going to say I hope this is a great move for you. I, um, I'm supposed to speak to the board, but I wish you well. And I thank you for your service. But the point is that Andrea's the only person in community development that's from the pre-Ralph regime. And uh, historic preservation needs familiarity with the city and its assets and its people. And we're losing that. And I'm very concerned about that. Uh, the Canary Barn is great for agricultural history, but Geneva Lodge is minimal without Geneva Lake and Geneva Village. 
and we're not taking action on the historic overlay district, mid-century modern overlay district. Um, we need to do that. All right. So Thank you, thanks Pam. very much yeah. for your consideration. All right. Thank you. I now close the public comment period at 6.49. Okay. Uh, general business. Um, we have two items under general business. The first item is HPB resolution 0322, a resolution of the Historic Preservation Board of the City of Littleton, Colorado, approving an application for state income tax credit for rehabilitation of a qualified historic structure located at 5455 Mohawk Road. Can we have the staff presentation now? Thank you. Can we have the slideshow begin? My name is Andrea Mimna. I'm planner in community development department here with the city. And I'm presenting tonight, as you see on the screen, um, HPB resolution 03-2022. And this is an application for historic preservation tax credit uh, in the Arapahoe Hills subdivision, 5455 Mohawk. This is the first tax credit application that the board has seen in very many years. I'm happy to get going on that. I'd also like to point out that Scott Turnbach in our department was the one who prepared the staff report and reviewed the application and worked with the applicant on this application. She's out of town this week, so I am presenting on her behalf. So the application summary is that, um, just a few points here to get going, that the state income tax credit program run by the state um, allows qualified properties uh, to get tax credits on qualified costs. And right now, the qualified costs are 25% of, um, or the, I should say the, the tax credit is 25% of qualified costs uh, of up to $50,000. And this property is eligible, it's a qualified property because it's a contributing structure in Arapahoe's National Reg Register District. The owners are Robert and Sue Olson, and they purchased the house, which is known as the Clark House, in 2020, and they began uh, the current rehabilitation project. Tonight we're reviewing both parts one and part two of the tax credit application. In terms of the process, the entire scope of work must meet the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation, and it must meet the qualified rehabilitation expenditure standards. And as I mentioned, this is a joint part one and part two application, and as part of the program rules, the entire project needs to be completed within 24 months. And so finally, the application has been made and the reviewing entity, which in Littleton is uh, our local government here, that's not the case with necessarily all the CLGs across the state, but we do review them here. And the reviewing entity must make the determination um, whether or not the credit meets the requirements within 90 days of submittal, and those requirements have all been met. Here's a map of Arapahoe hills. Um, you can see it in the darker yellow in the middle of that map. And then the actual house is shown. You see 5455 South Mohawk Road. It's outlined there in bubble format. And a brief history. So the house was built in 1959. I believe Arapahoe Hills was built over a three-year period beginning in 1959. And in 2012, uh, it was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And then in 2020, the Olsons purchased the property, and the period of this application was from July 2020 to July 2022. So the scope of work includes a number of different projects within. The, within. This, is a, this is a fairly substantial um, rehabilitation project. And here you can see the list of 10 items here. And just to quickly go over it, we're looking at um, modernizing the electrical system, roof materials, 
um, replacing of hot water heater and heating systems, modernizing the plumbing system, replacing kitchen fixtures and appliances, uh, replace single wind pane windows with double pane windows and replace flooring and fixture and bathrooms and then replace the flooring and the ceiling, um, modify the bathroom to accommodate modern appliances and then the exterior of the home was painted. And we'll go through some pictures that demonstrate, um, that show rather um, before and after pictures. Here you see before and after of the house from, taken from the, um, from the right of way. Um, before is on the left, and now you see it the way it looks today over on the right. We have some living space shown here with before and after pictures. And you notice that the kitchen is back there in the corner, and um, the picture on the right, the after picture, gives a little bit closer up um, view of what's going on there in the kitchen and the floors and the ceiling and that space in general. Another portion of the house before and after. Again, you see there's carpeting over in the before and you see the wood floors on the left and those wood paneling along the walls uh, remains. Close up of the kitchen, notice that the, um, the kitchen um, elements have been replaced and that is part of the rehabilitation project that complies with the Secretary of Interior standards, although not all of the kitchen uh, expenses and work comes under qualified costs. And uh, also notice that there is, on the left, on the before, you can see a table that kind of comes out um, into, the, into the kitchen area, creating a little passageway into the room, and that was determined to be not historic, not original, and that has been removed. Here you see the windows before and after, single pane to double pane, and you can see that the configuration remains the same. And the bathroom before and after, and you can see uh, some new tiling down on the, on the after. And that's not a qualified expense, but it is allowed under rehabilitation um, of the structure. Again, master, this one is the master bathroom. And so uh, in the staff's review of this application, we did find that the project scope of work does qualify for tax credits under the Secretary of Interior's for re rehabilitation and the qualifying costs, and the qualified costs total $112,727.40. So the applicant is, if this is approved tonight, the applicant is entitled to gaining a credit of 25% of that number. Based on our findings and review of the application, staff is recommending approval, and that's a resolution 03-2022, and that would approve the tax credit application for rehabilitation of the qualified historic structure. And that 25% amount comes to $28,181.85. Okay, that's my presentation, and I'm available for questions. Um, Robert Olson, one of the applicants, um, he and his wife, Robert is here, and he is available to answer any questions should the board have any. Robert, thank you. Does the board have any questions? I have a question, maybe a, a comment, but a, a question. Um, first of all, I just want to say fabulous house, and this must have been a, a wonderful and fun project, although I'm sure there were days you didn't think that, but this is really awesome. Um, the, I have had just a couple of things um, that I, I don't agree with in the assessment, and one is the floor material. Um, I think that was built in 1959, and um, I think that 
it would have been carpet. It would have been wall-to-wall -wall carpeting in 1959 in a mid-mod house like that, just because that was the, the modern and, and very kind of luxurious choice to make um, for a house like that. Um, and that's, uh, that's really the, the one point that, that I had. I, I really think that it would not have had wood floor it would have been carpeted in the living room. Anybody else have any comments? Chris? Jason? Laura? Okay. I would like to um, echo what Kim has said. Um, if the house originally had wood floors, they would not have removed them to replace the carpet. They would have carpeted over the wood floors. And when I looked through the documentation, I didn't see any hard evidence that there was wood floors there. The discussion in the um, report basically alludes to wood flooring, uh, that there's wood flooring in other houses in the neighborhood, which I would probably agree with. But if there was wood flooring, you would have seen nail holes, you would have seen shadowing, or anything else on top of the uh, subfloor. And when I looked at the pictures of the construction, I didn't see any of that on the subfloor. So I also do not feel that we have, um, the wood flooring would be a qualified, or the, or the ceiling either, which is a tongue and groove, six inch wide tongue and groove ceiling where the original ceilings were smooth, not smooth, but they were popcorn, but basically a smooth ceiling. The tongue and groove ceiling changes the texture and the appearance. Well, it looks very nice in the house. I mean, I don't disagree with that, but I don't feel it would meet the requirements of the state statute for rehabilitation tax credits. Does anyone have any comment if you, on that or? Are you looking for a staff comment? Yes, yeah, so the staff did review it, and we did consider that the wood floor actually quite a bit, and we were unable to find any evidence working with the applicant that, in fact, there were wood floors there previously. But based on the idea that wood floors were common in, the, in that era, and it did meet the Secretary of Interior standards, that in the scheme of things, that it could be considered a qualified cost but do understand the, um, the comments made by the board members. Okay. I don't have any more questions on that, except I agree the house is very well done. So, um, if I don't have it in, Chris? Can I just make a comment? Yes, you can. Um, I think it's amazing how you brought the house back. It had a lot of damage. And um, I just want to, <laughs> I guess, commend you for taking on such a massive project when there was so much plumbing and electrical issues. And um, so you did a great job. Thank you. OK. Um, <clears throat> there's no more questions. I'm going to close this portion of the discussion and ask the board for a motion. Anybody can make a motion. <laughs> um, I'm just going to read it. I move to approve H HPB Resolution 03 2022, approving the Historic Preservation Tax Credit 45455 Mohawk Road in the Arapaho Hills National Register Historic District. I second that. Is there a second? Okay. I have a is this the time to bring up? Okay. I have a um, motion to amend the resolution. And you have a copy in here. I'll read it to you. <clears throat> I move to amend resolution, um, uh, HPB resolution 03022 as follows. And if you have the resolution in front of you, I think you're going to need to see it in front of you to follow this. So if you could do that please so 
I move to A, strike number four, so count down number four, whereas that reads, whereas the Historic Preservation Board finds in fact that no historic features were removed in association with the applied improvements. I want to uh, modify number five, whereas, to replace the words, the kitchen and bathroom sufficiently emphasizes natural materials and forms that characterize Rappahoe Hills homes to tie original features to modern design with electrical, mechanical, and plumbing system upgrades supports the preservation and use of the property and. And then item C, uh, add a whereas after the fifth whereas that reads, whereas the Historic Preservation Board finds in fact that the window repairs and replacement improve the energy performance of the property and do not denigrate from the physical historic appearance of the property and. And I propose these to be more in line with what the state statute says and calls out for the tax credits. So it's clear in our resolution that we're following everything that the state uh, has and we're identifying those other areas that were upgraded that were not in the current resolution, which are a substantial portion of the cost of the project. I'm just waiting for a second, if you have one. Just waiting for a second. I second. Okay, Laura seconds it. Okay. Is there any discussion, uh, board, on these three amendments? I don't object to the second two. I'm just curious. Uh, you want to strike the fourth that says um, no historic features were removed. Is that because there were some historic features removed that you want to make note of? Yes, there were a lot of historic features removed. It's not detrimental to the project, but the kitchen, bathroom, and two bathrooms all had original finishes in them and materials and plumbing and those were removed. So just to keep it accurate. Just to keep it accurate to what the project is. Any other comments? All right, we'll take a vote on this amendment. Just, oh, amendment. just this, this one right here, okay? The vote is six in favor. The motion, the amendment carries unanimously. Okay. The second motion that I want to amend, I move to further amend HPB resolution 03022 as follows. A, modify the original, and this has to do with the flooring and ceiling cost only, this only portion that I'm uh, discussing. Modify the original ninth, whereas to replace $112,727.40 with $106,563.89. And modify section one to replace $28,181.55 with $26,640 dollars and 97 cents and condition the approval upon amending XD certification documentation to reflect a total approved amount for the rehabilitation as $106,563.89. I've got a question. So where do we put the condition for the approval? Well, this amendment has to do with discussing whether the, uh, Ashley. The condition for approval would be at the bottom in the resolution, we can add that in. Okay, just add it in, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. And then we would, if approved and voted on, we would change the exhibit D. Okay. The reason, okay. So I think do you're I, just looking for a second. Do I have a second? I'll second to move the discussion along. I second. Okay. 
The reason for this is, as was stated previously, it does not appear that wood flooring was original to the building. And the statutes, the state statute basically says, refinishing or replacing historic floor materials in kind, excluding carpeting, and reconstructing missing historic elements when there is sufficient historic documentation to guide the reconstruction. If the wood floors were not there to begin with, they're not historic. But they would not qualify for the tax credits because it's a re, it's a unapproved reconstruction according to the state statutes. And the states are pretty clear about replacing uh, non-historic materials with new materials during uh, a rehabilitation. To read the entire statute, I can read it for you. We did have it in the in the package. My main concern about this is it's very hard. To, it's, the preservation community works very hard to get these tax credits. And when you're doing rehabilitation, particularly on interiors, if you start getting, if you start allowing improvements that don't meet the historic preservation laws specifically, and in this case, using the word in kind, if the wood wasn't there to begin with, you can't replace it because it wasn't in kind. So if you, if you start approving projects like this, it can be, it could be, I feel, detrimental to the tax credits because people start adding a whole lot more interior finishes that do not meet the stand, Secretary of Interior standards. Can we discuss now? Is yes, we can. Okay. Um, I, I think that the staff report, um, they could not find any evidence of what was on that floor. Um, so I, I think that's what the staff report said. Right. That there is no documentation on, on what the original flooring material was. Um, and as far as the ceiling goes, um, the, the tongue and groove would certainly be appropriate to a period home like that. It doesn't sound like it was actually, you know, you're saying that it was probably popcorn ceiling all mm -hmm. originally. And I, I, I can't speak to that, but I know that um, my experience with um, mid-centuries of that era, um, that tongue and groove um, of a relatively locally available wood would have been, um, you know, perfectly appropriate. You would have, you would have seen that, but um, I, I really can't speak to whether or not that was in this house. It doesn't appear from the uh, description it was. It was a popcorn ceiling, which would have been pretty typical for this period. So it'd be drywall with a popcorn ceiling. Uh, so it would be a, a relatively smooth-looking uh, ceiling. It wouldn't have any texture on it except for the popcorn. But replacing it with a tongue and groove product adds a whole different feel to the entire project. One, it's not a smooth ceiling. And when I look at the statute, it states, reconstructing missing historic elements. If the element was never there, then it's not historic. It can only be historic if it existed during the period of significance. So what I'm looking at is if it was never a tongue and groove ceiling, it can't be considered historic. It would have to, to get the tax credit, you'd have to have a smooth ceiling in there. And the same thing would be with the floor. If there was never a wood floor in the house, then it's not historic. So you can't replace it if it's not historic. Uh, if, Chair, I... Microphone, please. Microphone, please. Oh. Uh, didn't the staff find and, and that uh, 
whether or not they were able to prove that there were that there was uh, wood flooring material in this house that they found that um, uh, flooring of that kind was possible for the area was common to the area and so that they, they had found it I mean in other words I'm trying to find the actual words our research into flooring materials for Arapaho Hills indicated that hardwood features such as sideboards and hardwood flooring were common features in Arapaho Hills and that was why they were recommending approving it I believe that's true um, do you want me to respond or you do? well I'll, I'll just state to Respond to, that's true, but it's not in this house. It could have been in other houses, but it doesn't appear to have been in this particular house. Chris, did you have a comment? All I was going to say is that um, this is a rehabilitation and not a restoration. And so um, I, I feel like there's a little bit more leeway um, with some of the materials that they're using, period appropriate and definitely neighborhood appropriate. Um, materials. So, Laura, um, can you, for the record, um, explain the cost? Of Microphone, the please. Can you? It's on. Okay. Um, can you explain, for the record, um, the cost that we are removing from the eligible um, tax credits? Yes, it is. Six thousand one hundred and sixty three dollars and fifty one cents. And where did you get those from? That's on the second to last page of the document under um, qualified costs. It also shows up under the application details, replace floor and ceiling with sixty one six thousand one hundred and sixty three dollars and fifty one cents. Okay. And I have to agree um, agree with Rick. Um, I think since we're dealing with a specific property that we have to be specific about the the things that were replaced and the things that were there. I understand that the neighborhood may have had them, other houses may have had them, but I think if we're dealing with a specific property, we have to deal with the specifics of that property. So I agree with Rick. I just want to point out that if the hardwood flooring was existing, then the staff wouldn't have used the word Potential hardwood flooring, it would be the flooring was removed and is being replaced. And when you use words like potential and compatible with the hardwood walls, that's not definitive as to the material originally being there. And so I'm, I'm just concerned that we meet the, the requirements of the state because we're going to have other projects come in with us and the states these tech credits are very lucrative to people who have historic properties nobody else has this opportunity so we have to be careful that we do not approve work that doesn't meet the secretary of interior standards and the secretary of interior standards are pretty clear that you can't add items that did not originally exist It doesn't take away how nice it looks, though. This is, I mean, it, that's a whole different issue, but it's mainly the tax credits. And we're making a determination that will go to the state that will be reviewed. And um, I think the city needs to be careful that they don't push the envelope and get something reversed. It wouldn't be good for anyone. Um, and yeah, because we're not the final say. It will be the state that will be the final say. So the downside would be that the state could potentially reverse it. They could potentially reverse it. Any other comments or discussions? I have one, Rick. Yes, um, Paige. How, so I just have a question about the tongue and groove ceiling. Yes. And how you said like the flooring, there might be some shadowing or nail marks. Would there be anything that, could, that would show or disprove having the tongue and groove there? No, the report states it was original popcorn ceiling. So it would have been originally a sheetrock ceiling. Uh, the, the tongue and groove is just a new modern feature, today's modern feature, that would go into it. So, and it looks nice. 
but it's not, it, it's not in-kind replacement. And we have to be very cognizant of that term in-kind. It's very specific. Um, it's not close to, but it is like the material. Just a, a, a kind of a, a question about that, using in-kind. Um, I would imagine, you know, not too many people actually spray popcorn ceilings anymore. And I think there are some issues with popcorn ceilings. So, you know, would it be even appropriate to ask someone if you're restoring something or, um, uh, you know, just doing a rehab on it to use a popcorn ceiling? No, I, I think, think the bigger issue is that the ceiling has one surface with no breaks in it across the whole surface, whether it's popcorn or not. I don't know how thick the popcorn was, it varies, but I think it's it more, it's like a plaster wall. The drywall replacing the plaster wall. They look the same, but they don't feel or touch the same. But this is a very strong visual element. Uh, it changes the whole character of the original architecture. Again, it's a nice design for today's modern standards. There's no question about it. And I would say through evolution it would fit in, but it's, it's the tax deduction part. That's the question. It's not the architecture or the design. Yeah, but right. the tongue and groove ceiling, those you know, relatively wide planks up there are absolutely appropriate to the time. Um, I mean, I grew up in stuff like this, and I grew up in Florida, and it was pecky cypress was the wood of choice, and uh, that wouldn't be available out here. But, you know, you, you, I, a, a ceiling like that really fits a, a home like this. It's a perfectly appropriate material to use, and, and it, it is beautiful. But I, I see the point about, it. you know, if it says it was a popcorn ceiling, it's, it's not a historic element. It's not replacing a historic element. That's the key, there's that word historic element. Yeah. The, words, the words in the statute are very carefully selected. And when you read it, they put a lot of emphasis on infrastructure because that's the one thing you want to, f that's most expensive and to repair in a building to save your building. Mechanical, heating, electrical, and windows, so. All right, any other comments? I'll call for a vote. Any more comments? I, I actually just wish that we could divide out the floor and the ceiling because I'm, I'm convinced, uh, hearing your point, nevertheless, I'm convinced by the floor but not necessarily by the ceiling. But they're one sixty two hundred dollar amount thrown together. Um, and I don't know how to rectify that. Um, so you have to take a vote on what's been proposed yeah. right now on the amendment. If this passes, it passes. If it's not, you are open to do another amendment. To your question, it wouldn't be hard to do that, but let's vote on this amendment. So we're voting on this amendment. The second, the, the second amendment only. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yes. Okay, everybody's voted. Close. It's a tie, three to three. The vote is three to three <laughs> with board member Henderson, board member Geddes, and board member Field voting no. Okay. The motion fails. It fails. All right. Okay. We'll move back to the main motion. Let's see. And vote on the main motion, but... Unless well, there are other amendments being proposed, well, then you true. would vote on the main motion as amended pursuant to your first amendment. Is there, a, let's, let's go back to the second amendment. Is there a, a motion for the second amendment? Is there another motion? No? That one's already gone and failed. So. Oh, oh, okay. So then is it, is it true that we can discuss if we would like to propose an amendment? 
Sir, I guess if someone wants to propose an amendment. Must we have the motion on the table before we can ask a question about that? No, you can discuss it right now as part of your discussions on okay. this main motion as amended. Well, my question is simple. Is the, can we separate floor from ceiling? Yes, because we have itemized costs. Okay. So that would be an easy... We, I don't know if we could do that now in here because it's going to be some math, but um, we can separate the floor from ceiling because the costs are itemized. Staff could come up with those numbers if needed. Can, can yeah. you do that right now so that we could do a new amendment, a new proposed amendment? Can we just make an amendment that would say we approve the flooring cost but not the ceiling cost? I mean, we need the numbers for the amendment because that's um, what's currently in the resolution. It's going to be under, um, I think it was the part one. No, part two has all the receipts. Mm -hmm. So you have to search through part two and find the receipts. You can propose to take a break if you want so we can do the wording. Um, okay, why don't we want take just a take a break for a few minutes. We'll find this. So we're in recess for a few. Okay, we're in recess for five minutes at 7.25 p.m.
ask a question? Yes. Um, you know, I, I go back to the staff report um, that found that they they really had no information one way or another about definitively what that floor would be. So I just think we have to bear that in mind that, you know, there wasn't definitive information and staff made the call that disqualified. Right. So. So if it's not definitive, it wasn't there. Uh, I'm sorry? If it's not definitive, it wasn't there. So Ashley, going forward, we would have to have a proposed new amendment. If someone is asking to amend what is okay. on the floor right now, yes, you need a new amendment. Okay, thank you. Can that I, differs from the last one Rick just made. Yeah. Can you can I use the verbiage from the proposed and failed second amendment just to, obviously this is probably what you're doing, just to subtract that number. And, you know. Yeah, go ahead. So, can I hear a motion? <laughs> Can you get the number I, from Andrea? What, what they? So can we get an approximate number and then move on? Does the staff have those numbers ready? Sorry, I thought that's what we were doing. Sorry. Are you ready with this? I think we're ready. Okay. What is the number that you have, Andrea? Well, let's see, for the ceiling, <clears throat> that was um, this number here, right? For the ceiling, we came up with two thousand four hundred and sixty dollars even. Three receipts totaling that number. Okay. Looking at the total cost between the two, that seems more reasonable. The ceiling should be less expensive than the flooring. So the number we are looking at is $2,460 for the ceiling. Can I have a motion to? Aren't, aren't you removing the flooring amount? We, yes, I need a motion for someone to do that for me. <laughs> remove the flooring amount. Not the from, ceiling amount. Well, the ceiling is 2400 so we got to remove the flooring from the 61. So basically, you would change the amount from 106 to 563.89 to 108-96389. You would add the ceiling back into the, the number. You'd add the ceiling back. That's, that's right. All right. Okay. May I ask another question that doesn't have anything to do with math? <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, and this is a, a question to staff, to Andrea. Um, the, the staff report and the presentation was to approve both floor and ceiling. Um, we have heard the rationale for the floor, um, but I'm not clear on your rationale for the ceiling. Why, why did um, staff think we should approve the ceiling as well? Well, I think it was a similar uh, rationale. As you said, it was, um, it was um, consistent with the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation, and we felt that it, was, it did not detract from the period style of the house and that um, in the scheme of things that it did work as, as a qualified cost. Okay. All right, thank you, Andrew. So do I have, we have. I can, I can make a motion. Okay, make the numbers, motion. If you want to. So. Uh, Before that happens, I really apologize, but I want to make sure if you're tracking the same language as Rick's motion that's in front of you, you have to change the numbers in A, B, and C. Yes. Um, and so I want to make sure you have the right number in. So let's see if this works. What I did was I subtracted 2460 from, I mean, I added 2460 to uh, uh, that uh, 106 number. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that, get, I, I'm going to read it in a minute, but that gave us 108 96389. A quarter of that is 27 to 40, 97. Yes, thank and, you. Okay. Okay. So, motion to amend. Uh, I move to further amend HPB Resolution 03 2022 as follows. 
modify the original ninth whereas to replace 112.727.40 with 108.963.89 and B, modify section one to replace 28.181.55 with 27.240.97. C, condition the approval upon amending uh, XD a certification document to reflect a total approved amount for rehabilitation as 108.963.89. Do I hear a second? I'll second. Okay. Any more comments? If not, we will vote. Well, I have just one question. I just want to be sure. Um, which is floor and which is ceiling? I'm sorry. That was with the ceiling taken out. Okay, ceiling taken out. Okay. Right. And um, another question is, um, you know, as, aside from the amendment, um, at some point, are we going to d discuss whether we even need an amendment or if we should just go ahead and vote to approve without an amendment? You could vote against so, the amendment, and that would... Let Ashley answer the question. Yeah. No, he's correct, because there is a motion for an amendment and a second. You have to vote on this. If you don't agree with it, you can vote to deny. Mm -hmm. And then we're still just back to the main motion with the First Amendment. Gotcha. Okay. So since it's on the floor, it needs a vote. So, everybody ready to vote? Yes. The vote is three to three. The motion fails. fails. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. So we move on to the original amendment. So we're gonna vote on the original amendment without subtracting. You mean the, the original motion? The original, the original motion. motion. Without subtracting any cost. Correct, so the original motion as amended pursuant to your first amendment changing the language in three whereas subsections, but nothing related to right. the numbers. All right, so is everybody ready to vote? Well, I've just one more point of discussion on that, just to be clear, that, um, you know, it, it's my rationale and my thought okay. is that um, staff has looked at it and made this recommendation, recommendation and, um, you know, ha has their rationale spread or um, sp spelled out so that if there are questions, at the state, um, they do have that information. Yes, I guess. And I, does this discussion go to the state? I don't think it does. I don't believe this discussion no, goes to the just state. Just the paperwork, okay? Yes. It's out of our hands after that. Okay. So let's, okay, so we're going to vote for the original amendment with no additions. The original motion. The original motion with no, with, the with the original costs. The original costs, no. the original staff recommended costs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're gonna vote for the one, first, amend, first motion original. amended with the original costs. Because we didn't change the costs with the original. Right, right. okay. Okay. All right, the vote is six in favor. All right, Mandy. The vote is six in favor. The motion carries unanimously as amended. Okay. Let's take a, does the five minute break before we go to the second resolution real quickly so we can hit the restroom and drink water at 7.45 p.m. Ashley.
And um, Historic Preservation Board has, has just done a lot of design guidelines and, uh, you know, really telling other owners of historic properties um, the processes by which they need to, to go about um, taking care of their buildings. And um, I think that the uh, city of Littleton is approaching this very well. I, I, I liked to see it. Um, I think they're doing a good job. And, um, it, you know, quite frankly, it's nice to see the city of Littleton, you know, put its money where its mouth is as far as uh, we're telling other people, um, you know, what they need to do to um, rehab their buildings. And it's good to see us following the guidelines. Thank you, Kim. Anybody else? I would just like quickly to say that this is a really nice, minimally intrusive preservation project. And um, if it had been maintained the last 30 years, it might not be so expensive. But otherwise, I'm all in favor of this, this project. So we can, uh, if someone would like to make a motion. I will, but do I have to read something <laughs> that's all correct? Thank you. I move to approve HPB Resolution 04-2022, authorizing the chair of the Littleton Historical Preservation Board to sign a letter in support of the city's grant application to the State Historical Fund for a rehabilitation project for Geneva Lodge. I second. Okay, thank you. Any discussion? I don't have any, so let's vote. The vote is six in favor. The motion carries unanimously. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're done with that. Uh, we do not have any public hearings tonight. Um, uh, next item is comments and reports. Does the staff have any, have any comments or reports that they would like to make? Uh, Jennifer. So as you, I think this is on, as you probably saw in the email with the packet, um, we are unfortunately losing Andrea. She has a wonderful opportunity. Um, so I just wanted to take this time to thank Andrea publicly for the years, almost two decades, um, that she has dedicated to the city and all that she um, has given the city and historic preservation and really putting our program on the map. Um, and she leaves an incredible legacy that hopefully Jesse will help us uh, <laughs> um, take care of. But I also just wanted to give this opportunity to you all to say your thanks as well. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Um, development staff, do you have any comments? Andrea, Jesse? I would just like to thank the board for being a really terrific board. Each and every one of you have added so much to the conversation of historic preservation in the city. And you bring so many different perspectives and talents to this meeting. And it's really been one of the best parts of my job for me, working with you guys. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah, I would just like to say, um, I was remembering a time that um, I walked through downtown Littleton with Andrea, and you know it was great to see buildings um, through her eyes, and it was also amazing to see all of the people that came up to us and stopped us, um, building owners, um, past building owners, just citizens, just all kinds of people, um, just kind of showing respect for Andrea. I mean, it was, it was really impressive. She uh, is very well respected and very well liked um, in this community. And this was long before she decided to leave. And uh, I was very impressed by that, and I feel the same way. All right, thank you, Kim. 
Anybody else? I'd just like to say thank you for all the years that you've kind of guided me along and made it a really wonderful committee to sit on. So thank you. Chris? I was just going to say um, it, it's been wonderful to work with you here because I worked with you um, at the SHPO when you were in Longmont and then you came to Littleton and now you're going to Lafayette. Like you seem to have a thing for cities that start with L's. Um, <laughs> But um, you will be sorely missed um, because you have so much knowledge um, and expertise. And um, I hope you will stay in touch. Thank you for everything. Okay, Jason. I, I just I just want to say I just actually just got here, but it's been a joy working with you and your your emails. It's it's so funny because they're so professional and yet there's a real heart to them and and I just sense the joy that you bring to the work that you do and I, and I I hope that you remember that and, and go and do great things. Thank you. Yes, Andrea, I've known you a long time. You started your job right after I left the board, I believe, in 2003. And um, I left the board in 2003. You started in 2004, and that was right after we attempted to do a downtown historic district that did not work out very well. And I retired from preservation for a while. I got, <laughs> we worked a long time on that. But um, you've done a lot of, tremendous amount of work over the last 15, 16 years or so. Um, and uh, I've done a, just brought Littleton along quite a bit. Uh, I appreciated all of our discussions. When I reached out to you about 10 years ago just to start talking about background and preservation in Littleton. We had a lot of frank discussions and how to move forward in preservation, what the issues were, the political landmines, which, as you know, there's lots of political landmines. And um, I really appreciated that. I got involved when we started looking at the Mid-Mod Mile. And Amy and Kim were on a committee. They're the board members. I was a HLI member. We did a lot of great things for Mid-Mod Mile. And I think probably the best thing was that logo. It's a wonderful logo that we created. Um, when I applied for the preservation board, I told the city council my goal was to have a new historic district in downtown in three years. I'm not sure how they felt about that. They probably thought, oh, that's okay, Rick. I don't know what you thought, Andrea, when I said that. But um, COVID happened. Well, first, we got, I got on the board, and then we were in Zoom meetings for a year and a half. So we had a whole board. We didn't even meet for a whole year. Then COVID happened. But then uh, we started pushing for the historic district. We all had a lot of time. And with your leadership and a lot of time on the board, we got that done in two years. And I think it was a surprise to anyone. I've never seen anything in preservation move that quickly in the city of Littleton. So I know the last two and a half years between the the historic district, the ULUC, which won't even go there, and um, the legacy list um, project that's almost completed. You've done a, a lot of really great work. So I just want to thank you for your time and your friendship over these many years, and we'll stay in touch. And Longmont, I mean, Lafayette is very lucky to get you. All right? I can ask you. All right, I'm going to adjourn this meeting at 8.02 p.m. We'll take a five-minute recess and we'll then have the study session start.
agreement between her and Stork Milton Inc., Toll Brothers, for the preservation of the Canary Barn. And um, Gretchen Rice Hill. Rice Hill is here with her. She's a new board member for Stork Milton Inc. So go ahead, Gail. Thanks, Rex. Um, I know several of you, but some of you I don't, so I'll do a little introduction of myself and Gretchen so you get to know us. Um, I am a former board member, like you guys, uh, three terms from 2000, uh, 1997 to 2005. We were original. Board. Yes, we, Rick and I were on that uh, original first board. Um, my work over my work career was a historic preservation consultant. I retired in 2018, and I prepared a lot of historic surveys and wrote the history section for environmental impact statements. Um, Gretchen Rice Hill um, is a, a preservation planner. She's been a preservation planner in Sioux City, Iowa. She's was I got to know her when she was the assistant community development director in Glenwood, and I did a survey for Glenwood, um, and I was really glad to see her in Littleton last fall. She is back working in Arapahoe County, and so really grateful to have her on the Historic Littleton Board um, to um, beef us up. So um, both of us were involved in the Canary Barn project. So um, what I'm going to do tonight first is um, talk a little bit about why the barn is important um, and then give a chronology of Historic Littleton's involvement in the Canary Barn, which morphed into my personal involvement in the Canary Barn. And then um, lessons learned and um, changes that we think should be made based on our experience with the process. So um, let's first talk about the barn, why it's important. Um, it, the land was kind of cool because it was part of a, a 160 acre military warrant that was granted to Charlotte Furdom. She was the widow of Sergeant William Furdom, who was in the New York militia during the War of 1812. So he was killed in that conflict. She, as his widow, got a 160-acre military warrant. She sat on it for a long time, from 1812 to some point when she assigned it to John W. Clark. I have no idea if he is um, like a son from a next marriage or what his relationship was. But um, he redeemed it in May of 1866 and quickly sold the land to David and Eliza Linhart. So they were the first people pretty much to occupy that 160-acre parcel. They had come to Colorado from Pennsylvania in 1865, and they started the Linhart Ranch there. Um, they ranched there for 50 years. Um, until 1918, and they had a daughter, Catherine May. And I gave um, this similar talk last week to our HLI annual board meeting, and one of the women there raised her hand that she had been, she had lived when she was younger on the May farm. So I'm going to try to talk to her and beef that story out a little bit. But that was, that's one of the great things. You tell a story, somebody else says, hey, I've got this to add, and move on from there. Um, so anyway, the Linharts were there for 50 years. And in 1918, they sold the property to J.D. Canary, who was a wealthy oil and cattleman from Texas. Um, Carey, uh, Canary renamed the ranch Wildacre Ranch, and he raised award-winning Hereford cattle there. And I, um, in my looking at whatever I could find on Canary, um, it, there was reference made to Hereford prize-winning lists, and so I just happened to look at the list. There were 22 of his um, cattle on the list that I looked at, um, so he had a lot of them. Um, and so he built that barn the first year in 1918. And what was great about the barn, um, a common style in the Midwest and in the East, um, but not so common out here, it was built into a bank so that on one side you could go in and take care of the cattle from 
from the ground level. You could walk around to the other side of the building and you're one story higher and you could drive your tractor in and do your work on that level. Um, so it's the only bank barn in Littleton. It's the largest barn in Littleton. It's over a hundred years and um, all of those things adding into its prominence. So Canary um, kept that ranch for 14 years until 1932. I think his health was bad. I looked at his obituary and he died not too long after that and it said of a long illness. So perhaps his health situation prompted him to sell. And he sold to a guy by the name of Charles Phillips who started dividing the parcel up and selling off parts. Part One of the parcels and the piece that had the barn on it was sold to Kenton Enser, and he purchased the, the, that parcel, and he was a home builder. He began Casey Enser Construction Company in 1932, which was the year that... Um, Canary sold the barn and he began building um, homes to sell. He built a lot of homes in Denver in the Park Hill neighborhood um, and by 1962 Enzer, having built so many homes, realized what do people want for their homes? Turf! And so he, on his land, created the Green Valley Turf Farm and that was in 1962 and that turf farm operated um, through 2017. Enser himself died in 76, but um, his descendants, um, Wendy Cogsdale, had the parcel that was recently sold to Toll Brothers. So it's important for its architectural style, last remaining bank barn in Littleton, biggest barn in Littleton, over a hundred years old, and most importantly, it's one of the few great buildings left showing Littleton's agricultural heritage. We started out as an agricultural community. What do we have to show that reflects that anymore? This is one of them. Okay, so let's talk about how we got to where we are. Um, the, first, um, the first and second most important references to that barn were surveys. Um, that were done by historians at Colorado Department of Transportation. The first one, 2004, the next, 2012. Both of them assessed the barn as eligible for the National Register. In 2017, a cultural resources study was done by Martin and Martin, who is the engineer for Toll Brothers. Um, and that is, that study provided most of the information I told you, the early information about the property, about the War of 1812 and that stuff. So um, we got aware of, um, we, meaning Historic Littleton, of Toll's plans in the spring of 2019, at, at which time, short, a couple months later, on August 23rd, 2019, HLI wrote its first letter to the city council saying, hey, we hear there's a development coming down the pike and there is a terrific building on this property and this building should be saved. Um, that was the first one. Then um, almost two years passed till March of 2021 when Historic Littleton wrote another letter to city council and this one again said, we're aware of these plans. Um, this great building is on there. Why is it important? You know, talk about it. We talked about its importance to Littleton's agriculture. And we basically just said, keep it on the site. Do not demolish it. And gave an example of the Dynas Barn, which was one I was familiar with, um, incorporated into a subdivision in Fort Collins, right at the south, the Shenandoah, right at the south border of Fort Collins. And, you know, that barn is... Or, a nice part of that subdivision. So I gave that as an example. And then I also threw in something about all the policies in the Envision Plan that supported historic preservation to just say, you guys talk this way, let's see some action this way. Okay, and then in the ensuing year, you know, multiple discussions of how do we bring attention to the barn? What should we do with the barn? Um, one of the things we did is historic Littleton, we decided to uh, beef up our information and our educational programs about agriculture in Littleton. So um, 
I prepared a PowerPoint, showed part of it at the first community meeting um, on the landmark application. But we thought the more people know about this barn, the more people will be um, willing to step up and say, hey, don't tear this down. So um, that brings us to, um, oh, and after that letter to city council, the Littleton Independent wrote a really nice story. This was April 22nd, 2021. Um, where they talked about the importance of the barn and they said um, in, it's, you know, one consideration may have been to reconstruct a replica of the barn on the site that was brought up 2021. Fast forward to March 2022, the Historic Preservation Board meeting. Um, Toll gave their presentation and they basically said it wasn't feasible to save the barn, so they build a new one on the site. It wasn't going to be a bank barn. It wasn't going to be the same size. Um, I believe some of you said, why? Um, or something in a perhaps less direct way that got the same point across. So um, that, uh, that was March. And so we talked about it at HLI and we said, well, um, now's the time to do something. Um, this this property needs, property needs to be designated as a landmark. So I wrote a landmark application. I downloaded the, I went to the existing website and I downloaded the existing form that was in there. Um, and I wrote a letter again, the third one to city council on this structure and basically said, um, we realize the developer has said it's not feasible to save this barn. However, we recommend you get a historic structure assessment through History Colorado. I included the link. Again, I said why the barn was important and threw out a few of the plans and policies direct from the Envision plan and um, included with that letter to City Council a notification that we had prepared a landmark application and it was attached. At the same time, on the same day, I sent the landmark application to community development um, and I got a phone call, I think, the next day and said, can you come in for a meeting, um, which I did. And um, at that meeting, um, one of the first things that was pointed out is that I was supposed to have done a pre-application meeting before submitting the landmark application. And so that I am um, doing a little lead into Gretchen's list of the recommended changes. She's going to go over this later. But that was one of the first things. There was nothing on the application that said you have to do a pre-application meeting. Um, so these kind of things are things that need to be fixed. So um, I was heading out of town on a month-long trip. So the pre-application meeting um, was held in May. A week before that meeting, um, the Littleton Independent did a very nice story. In fact, it was on the it was the front page story about the barn and its um, why it was great and how it was threatened. So Gretchen did the meeting, the pre-application meeting, on May 20th, um, and it was mainly staff for the developer and the existing property owner that came, legal staff and other staff. Um, that meeting was held, and, um, I, and I forgot something. About a week before that meeting, I got an email from Andrea that said, um, Historic Littleton, Inc. is not eligible to do a landmark application. And I said, I would like to see the legal description, the legal assessment of how we are not eligible and the parts in the code. I had the code. I had highlighted the pieces of it. Um, basically, it said uh, non-consensual, I mean, I have it right here, so I might as well read it to you. It said, um, a nomination and application when a property is found to have the potential for designation to the Littleton Historic Register, an application shall be filed. A nomination for listing may be made by, one, owner of the property to be designated, two, 
a member of the HPB. You guys could have saved me all this trouble, actually. <laughs> um, three, a member or members of the council. And four, non-owners of a property or properties to be designated, in which case the applicant shall be a resident, owner of property, or have a place of business in the city. So Historic Littleton has been doing work in the city for 32 years but it was not assessed apparently as a place of business in the city. So this leads to another recommendation and Gretchen will get to that. What is the purpose of a non-consensual designation without having the ability of a, an organization whose function is historic preservation to be able to actually suggest that a building might be historic. So that's that's on the to-do list. So um, to solve that problem, I submitted the application on my own as a citizen. S hence, when you saw the agreement, it was signed by me as a citizen, by me for Historic Littleton, and by Toll Brothers. So, um, I agreed to do it as on my own. Gretchen uh, handled the pre-application meeting. I got back in town and Toll Brothers contacted me for a meeting. That meeting was held on the 3rd of June. And um, it was, I thought, a very good meeting, very direct and straightforward. And basically, um, they knew our interest in the building. I told them we would be remiss if we did not try to make this a landmark and save this building. Um, and they had concerns that they were a long way down the process. They did not want to be derailed after lots of time, energy, money had gone into the process. And, and we left it that, um, you know, that we could, this could be possible. We could think, we had a lot of people who had good ideas and we could, somehow come together and make this work out for everybody. So then um, I didn't hear from them after that meeting for a couple of weeks, at which point I scheduled the first community meeting for the landmark application. And that was held on, um, oh, at that meeting, I should also say, um, <coughs> they asked me if it would be okay to move the structure on the site. And I said, or if, if it would be okay to move the structure. And I said, um, why? And they said, if the property is in a floodplain and they would have to fill the property. So if they left the barn exactly where it was and did nothing and placed up to nine feet of fill adjacent to it, the barn would be in a depression. So all drainage would come down. It would be in a puddle, basically. Um, so they said they they had to, to fill it. And I said um, it was more important for us to save the barn and have it on the exact same property. Um, but I said it could not be moved off of the property because it would lose its context, its historic context. But it would be acceptable to move it somewhere else on the property. Okay, so um, we have the community meeting. The city um, sent out the notifications to property owners within 1,000 feet? 700. 700 feet. And um, at the meeting, we had two people that were not city staff. So our meeting was held at Carson Nature Center, South Suburban staff, or HLI. So we had two people, one of which was the former property owner, the descendant of Enser, Wendy Cogsdale, and one other property owner. There was a glitch in the notification and somehow Toll Brothers did not get notified. And so um, they weren't there. Um, and a couple days later, I heard from them. And they said, um, you know, can you come for a meeting? I said, okay. So on the um, 19th of July, um, I met. 
Um, in the meantime, uh, Andrea and I had selected dates for a second and a third meeting. So initially, we had the first meeting. Um, I had notes here from uh, from called Notes from Canary Barn Pre-App, and it was written from Jennifer to Michael Sutherland, and it was a summary of the meeting that Gretchen had, and it said, because this is a landmark des designation, we can waive the second neighborhood meeting. But when I got to that meeting and held it, Andrea informed me that um, there was a glitch in the mailing and the Toll Brothers hadn't been notified. And as such, we would have to hold a second and a third meeting. So this is another on the to-dos. There should be a straightforward process. An applicant should know how many meetings they have to do. An applicant should not have to do additional meetings from something that was no fault of their own. It, it should be written out. There should be a flow chart. There needs to be a straightforward process, not surprises along the way. Um, so um, I, I get the call about would I come to a meeting. And at that meeting, um, it was, I'm sitting in the um, lobby waiting for them to call me. And a guy comes up and he says, are you Gail? And I said, I am. And he said he was Marcus uh, Peckner, who had been hired by Toll as a consultant to work on the whole Littleton project. And uh, he he started saying something about he, something he had done with Englewood. And I mentioned, I said, oh, I'm working with Englewood now on the City Ditch Project. And so we started talking about the City <coughs> Ditch. So we go into the meeting, and um, it is with um, the two staff people I had met with in June, plus the president of the Western Group of Toll Brothers, plus Marcus. And basically at that meeting, um, they said they were willing to sign an agreement um, towards saving the barn um, and if I would withdraw the application. Well, that was one relatively straightforward path, but we had just brought up the city ditch, which also flowed on their property. And um, so I said, well, I... Um, I need to see the city ditch on your property to look at that segment to see what type of integrity it has. Um, so the next morning, um, I went out and met with Toll on the site and looked at the city ditch. And um, the segment that was there was, um, it was short. It was not, um, you know, it was probably not even as long as this room. Um, it, it looked decent. Um, you could tell it had not been modified much, but it came out from a pipe. It went into a pipe. It was a short piece. And um, in our efforts to save um, a, a visible part of City Ditch, we want to focus on the two segments of the ditch that are the most visible to the public, the one near St. Mary's Ball Fields and the one near Slaughterhouse Gulch. Um, so um, I said to them, we will not, um, you know, if, if you structurally stabilize this building and move it and put it to another place on the site, we will not do anything about the ditch. So um, a draft was written up, um, went back and forth, I think, three times, and um, we got the agreement that you saw. Um, the main pieces of the agreement are that... Um, Historic Littleton or myself or members of Historic Littleton would not do a landmark application for anything on the Toll Brothers property. So the ditch or the barn. Um, in, in exchange, they will move the barn. They have hired Mammoth Moves. Um, I noticed today that Mammoth Moves has a big banner hanging on the barn, and I have gotten emails that have indicated they're planning on moving pretty quickly. On moving, what they're going to do is put a, um, a moving frame underneath the barn, 
they're going to move it from that site so that they can fill it. It's going to be at a temporary location. They're going to fill the site. They're going to build a foundation in a bank configuration. They're going to put the wheels back on the moving frame, bring that moving frame to the new foundation, and put the barn on it. They, um, the company, Mammoth Moves, has been doing, specializing in historic building moving since 1995. They moved the Lace Hawk the Lace House, sorry, in Blackhawk. Um, they moved the Boulder Jaycees Train Depot. They did Judge Silverthorne's House in Breckenridge. So they have done a lot of historic structures. So I was very grateful that it wasn't any old moving company, that it was one that specialized in historic structures. And so I anticipate that that's probably going to happen with within the next month or two, is my guess, um, because the banner is on. And um, I did get a series of 50. I asked them for dimensions of the barn, um, as is now. And that, that was when they thought they were still going to dismantle it. Um, and now they're not going to have to dismantle it. There's... They're making it stable enough that they can put it on that moving frame, store it there, and then move it on. And their plan for the barn is just to do that external structural stabilization. They're doing nothing to the interior. They're going to sell it as a private parcel. So the, the parcel will be divided into many individual properties. They will sell it as an individual property. So it is up to the purchaser to do any of the interior rehab reclamation. I did get them to give me about 50 pictures of the barn as is now so that there's a good record of the interior. Chris. So you said that um, nobody from HLI will landmark the property. Is that like forever? No. Um, okay. On their first draft, they didn't have a time frame in. So I went back and said, hey, you know, this property will probably want to apply for, for, grant. for grants for rehab okay. from the State Historic Preservation Fund. And I said, so you, you know, we have to have an ending time. And they said, well, we don't know how long it will take. And so we agreed on two years after Toll Brothers leaves or 10 years from the date of the agreement. Okay. So, um, you know, we had to, had to get something in there. Yeah, I'm just, I'm thinking of... Yeah, so it might be a hassle for the first buyer. You know, for the first buyer. I was hoping that it, you know, so they're moving it, which is, which is great. Um, I just worry about like the exterior condition and you said they're going to take care of the exterior. They said they're going to make it structurally stable. Okay. Does that include the roof? Yeah. Yes. Awesome. They're going to fix the holes in the okay. roof. Because I, I just want to make sure that it's not kind of end up, ending up being like demolition by neglect where, oh, like if we don't, you know, do enough to keep it around for 10 years that it'll just kind of fall to pieces and then we can build on well, the um, site anyway. The, kind it'll of be put on the market. I mean, it would not be to their advantage to hold that property for 10 years and let it fall apart. My guess is it'll go for a um, barn wedding venue. Yeah. And the good um, thing is it's saved right now. Yeah, so and it's, it's, you know, to find any use for it is fantastic um, so that we still have it. Um, so Gail has to defend against any landmarking application that comes in. No, I don't have to oh, defend don't. against a landmarking application. I have to defend the project. The project, right. And um, what I asked, you know, what do you mean? <laughs> um, and they just said, defend the, the process that we went through to arrive at this, you know, to say that you're <laughs> happy with it, that you agree with it, to defend our process. Um, so that's in there. We yeah. have the barn. That's pardon. We have the barn. That's. Yeah, I so mean, it's a give and take. Yeah. You oh know? yeah. You have to be flexible. You can't just stand there and dig your feet in and not be willing to, you know, move flexible. a little bit. So, you know, I felt um, I felt mission accomplished. Okay, you know, I want to commend you for personally doing this. Yes. Through yeah. 
So it's the first time it's happened in Littleton. So that's a precedent. But as we know, there were some issues with the process. And Gretchen has some recommendations. She does. She wrote a, a very good memo. I just wanted to summarize to say um, then on the 20th of uh, July, at about 8 o'clock when I finally got home that night, I emailed Andrea and said, I'm officially withdrawing the landmark application. So yes, Gretchen. Oh, well, right and now. it's really just a short list, and right now it's just an email form. So I'd be happy to. Did you it receive as a memo it? By the way, form. I sent it oh. to Rick. Did you guys get it in your packet? I forwarded to you, Andrea. Oh yes, I have a copy of it. Okay. I didn't. I, I can certainly. Okay. Forward. I haven't seen anything. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would like Andrea, to see it. Andrea, I'd be more than happy to reformat it so it's a more formal memo as opposed to an email. If, oh. if it would help. Okay. Sure. Whatever, you, um, whatever you like. Okay. Uh, so, well, the first the first takeaway was that we recommend that you do not process landmark applications like a typical land use application. So we thought to create a more streamlined process. Um, we felt that one neighborhood meeting, likely before the applicant gets to the Historic Preservation Board would suffice because as I understand it now, you'd have to go, the applicant then would also then re be required to have a neighborhood meeting prior to the application being forwarded to the City Council. So we thought that just, just one neighborhood meeting would suffice. Obviously, I say that with the caveat that if the application changed in any significant manner, you would redo that uh, the neighborhood meeting. Um, we recommend that you clarify that landmark applications obviously can be submitted by an entity, an LLC, uh, rather than a, or a corporation, and so or a nonprofit can submit an app, uh, application. This is very similar to the the, um, the process of um, land use, the land use process where an entity or a company can be an applicant. Um, the next one is put the landmark application process on the city's website. Now I say that with the understanding that I, I know that you all um, redid your entire land use code. So I did that in Glenwood Springs and I understand, you know, things get backed up. So I, I, I get that. But um, we felt that a flow chart that illustrates the landmarking process would also be really helpful to anybody. Um, and then for, especially for the non-consensual landmark applications like, like this one was, um, and this is a really technical thing that came up during the process, um, we need to eliminate the requirement to actually post the property because you don't want um, somebody who isn't the property owner going onto the property to post the property for a landmark application that they didn't want necessarily in the first place. That's a problem. So if you could just sort of technically get rid of that requirement or clarify that it's not, it's not required. And that's really it. I mean, that, that, those five things were our, our major takeaways from, from this process. So like I said, I'll put it in a memo. Sir. Sure. But thank you for doing this. We've never had a non-consensual designation in Littleton. There's only one way to see if the system works is to do it. But it is a very important tool that we need to have with good guidelines. It doesn't make it very difficult if we're going to preserve our resources. So um, I know the board, I know there's um, got to update the EYUC. I don't know when it's going to happen, but this will be part of that. We have to we'll, we'll talk about Probably sooner than later next year, sometime. So, but thank you for doing sure. this. I, I just like Good to job. say, um, I really appreciate you, Gail, doing this, and, and Gretchen for jumping in there as well. And um, I think that the, the barn is very fortunate that uh, someone like you, who, who could bring decades of professional experience to creating this application, because. Um, <clears throat> It, I, I know it was a lot of hours of work for you, but for someone else, they could have been totally intimidated and just not even known where to start. 
Um, and so I think that the barn is very fortunate um, to have had you doing this application. But I think um, one kind of takeaway from this that I'm happy for is that it, it shows that a citizen can do this. And um, I think that's important that I'm, citizens I'm could be able to because, do, uh, should be know, able to do this. It looked bad for the barn after that meeting in March. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you've come and told us a different story that's amazing. Also, the engineer, the engineering challenge of moving a bank barn, a, a two-level building like that. I cannot wait to see the sped-up video that explains that. But, but thank you so much. It's going to be a cool event. Yeah. I think the coolest thing is that you're, it's going to be in the same location. I kept thinking if they save it and move it, it won't be the same because you won't be able to see it. And the fact that it'll be saved and left on the same location is, is well, wonderful. Well, the same it's parcel. 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 Right. Yeah, same okay. 77 acres. Okay. And one of the things we didn't talk about is also we agreed to together put some interpretive signs. They will build them. I will write them. Okay. I think it's wonderful. Thank you so right. much. Well, thank you, Gail, for coming in. I know you drove down from Buena Vista to do this. Oh. HLI. -H -L Buena Vista, in... not Buena. Buena. Buena Vista? Buena Vista. Mountains. Buena Vista. Someplace over HLI has been fishing preservation in Littleton for a long time. Mm -hmm. And 32 years. Countries. So Geneva Lodge is another one that was saved because of HLI. So thank you for coming in. And are you welcome? Take your comments into consideration. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. The next item on our agenda is uh, ID number 22193, training on the interpretation and implementation of the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. Rick, I am going to go. Um, I presented Secretary of Interior Standards two weeks ago, so I feel comfortable with that. Yeah, I know you okay. know. <laughs> All right. All right, so we have Joe Salzabar, and who's with you? Sarah Kappel. Hi, Sarah. Hi. I'm Rick Brunnerberger. Welcome to Littleton. So you can come up here. Hang on a second. So, <clears throat> a bit of a confusion, because I, I just said that we were going to talk about the task credit programs themselves and not the standards in particular, but let me pull up the standards now. Let's see what I've got. Our standard spiel is to talk about the task credits and how to review them. General guidance for that. What do I have time for tonight? I suppose we could do that. Let's do what we, we need to do. What was posted on the agenda? Well, it's all part of the standards. It's just yeah. that part of the um, <laughs> interpretation and implementation of the standards. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to do that because you guys have not done the task credit project until tonight. Well, we can't talk about that tonight. No, no, we're but, not talking about that one. No, yeah. but we can talk about the process, and I think you would learn something from it. We can always come back to talk about the standards themselves, or you can just kidnap Chris and make her do it. <laughs> well, she's already done. She's already done. Let's talk about we it. Let's talk about it. volunteer her without her knowing. Here's the thing. When you're not in a meeting, you have all the stuff to do. Yep. Let me just read to you what was on our, on our agenda. And then also, so the title of what is on the agenda is Training on the Interpretation and Implementation of the Secretary of Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. And then there was a staff report related to that, Andrea, that kind of outlined what the training would be. So for open meetings rules, we need to stick to what we posted. Hmm. So Joe, watch your presentation and then ad lib it from there, because I know you can do that. <laughs> well, the thing is, I mean, if we're going to do that, then I'm not going to present at all, and we'll just talk about standards. Okay. That's going to be the rule, because there's no point in presenting something that has nothing to do with it. Yeah. Um, so I guess this would be more of a, and it's going to take a bit longer, but just a question of more to you, um, issues that you have. So there are the Secretary of Interior standards were created in 1979. They have been in the same configuration since 1982. Uh, they've not changed at all since then. So... And that was only a change to standard number six. That's really the only change that was made. Standard number six originally was that you had to have um, 
materials you had to replace with like materials. And at the time, the vinyl siding industry threw a hissy fit. No, vinyl siding is just as good. In fact, vinyl siding is better. In fact, in the future, everyone will have vinyl siding on their houses, and there will be no such thing as wood siding because it's terrible and horrible. And you, then we're going to sue you, the National Park Service, if you if you insist that people have to put this terrible wood siding on their homes. So they bent to pressure and they changed it. And so the Secretary of Interior Standard Number Six says, where possible, materials. If you've ever wondered where that awkward statement comes from, it's from the vinyl siding, folks. Um, otherwise, the standards have not changed at all. There are occasional proposals to change them, but the ones that we see the most often, so, and I, I've been doing this so long, I can rattle them off the top of my head. Standard number one is that you need to, to have a good fit for the building. We run into problems sometimes with this because you probably have dealt with this. Certainly the barn is one of these things where it's a white elephant, it's a specific design building for a specific purpose. How do you repurpose a building? That can certainly be a challenge because standard number one says, if you can't fit what you want into the building that you have without making huge changes to the character defining features of that building, you can still do the project and it might be a great project, but it's not a project that meets the standards. And that is a theme throughout the standards. It's something really important to keep in mind when you're talking to applicants. Not meeting the standards is not a judgment call on the project itself. It is not saying that it stinks, although some of them clearly stink when they do that. It's not you saying that it stinks. It's you saying it doesn't meet the standards for rehabilitation. And then you're citing those standards like standard number one saying, well, you know what? You want to fit um, 50 apartments into this um two-story commercial block, it's not going to fit. You, know, you have to chop up everything, all the public rooms and everything, into little tiny, tiny rooms. That's not going to work. It's not. Find a different use for it that's going to fit. So don't be afraid to tell people, hey, this is not, okay, have you thought about, I know you run the numbers, if you run the numbers for other things. Sometimes there are other ways to do things and or just let them know ahead of time, look, you're not going to meet those requirements. Um, a bulk of the standards is about keeping historic features. So that's a, probably the biggest thing to take away. Um, standards time and time again, standard number six is the one you'll probably use the most often. If you have a material that is deteriorated, your first step is to replace it with the same material. If that material is, um, well, actually your first step would be to repair it. So let's say I got a wall, so it says, let's pretend this wall is plaster and it's not drywall, but if it were plaster, my first goal would be to keep this where it is. Um, sometimes you'll get the asbestos folks will come out and they'll do a little swipe on it and be like, this has asbestos in it. Spoiler, all plaster has asbestos in it. They didn't really ban asbestos in any kind of, even sheetrock um, until the 1980s. So there's asbestos everywhere, but if, as long as it's encased in the wall, it's not a danger to anybody. I mean, if you were to punch the wall and take a good solid breath of all the fibers that came out, that's, I wouldn't recommend that. But generally, it's a safe thing. So the standards say if you have historic materials, you want to save them wherever possible. If this wall had a bunch of cracks in it and it was broken up, then your next step would be to repair it in kind. Uh, and that means getting someone out to plaster it. That can be very expensive. There aren't that many plasters anymore. My grandfather did it for like 70 years. He's not around anymore. There aren't that many plasters around anymore. So the next step would be to replace. This is where that change in 1982 comes into effect. Where possible materials, which means if you could replace it with something that is visually similar, even if it is a different material, it's acceptable under the standards. So replacing a plaster wall with this kind of drywall wall would meet the standards because when I stand over here and I look at it, I'm probably not going to notice much of the difference. Now, if I were to place this with a brick wall, uh, if I were to replace it with a glass wall, that's a different story because that is not only a different material, but it is a much different in terms of visual effect. I won't talk about the thing we talked about earlier, you all talked about earlier tonight, but that is something to consider. When people make changes to materials, it's not just a question of physicality, it's a question of color, it's a question of materials, it's a question of is it within the period of significance? Is the kind of a thing that would have been in there? Are you replacing something that would have been historically significant that was specifically designed to characterize the space? That's another big thing. When they built this room, someday this building might be historic. You never know. Um, 
It will be someday. So much more. Um, you know, this was this was sort of the character defining feature of this space is basically the space, a big open space, and that's pretty much it. But there's not a lot of historic materials in here, right? So you, you have more of an open hand because when they designed this building, the goal of it wasn't to impress you with the walls. It wasn't to impress you with fancy paneling. It was really to just have this big open space, and that's sort of the character defining feature. If you imagine this room chopped up into little apartments and how much different that would appear uh, than if it is here. So sometimes when you're following the standards, it's a question of saving individual materials, but that's not always the case because sometimes materials were never really meant to be anything more than run on the mill what was available at the time. And so that's a delineation that's up to you to make. It's also up to the applicant to demonstrate that. If they want to replace materials, they should be the ones coming to you and saying, I want to replace X with Y because X is very important and I would rather do Y. And to show that that was never meant to be a character defining feature of the space. What a lot of certified local governments will do uh, is that they will divide a space up into primary areas, which is like the wow space. Think of, it, think of a hotel, you walk in the lobby, that's really the wow space. It's the fanciest part of the hotel. That's sort of your class A space. Then you get the secondary spaces, uh, the stairways, the elevators, the hallways, the side rooms, the restaurant, things like that. Those are mostly decorated, but not super fancy. And then you've got the back of the house stuff, the laundry, the furnace room, the you know, the washrooms, things like that. Very, very basic cinder block kind of stuff. A lot of people will do that with houses as well when they're approaching the standards and deciding what is an appropriate material and what is not. Uh, yeah, that cinder block is original to the building, but do we really want to save the cinder block? Are we going to demand that they restore the cinder block and not replace it? Versus that original marble, Italian marble floor do we want to save that or allow them to replace it? That's the things that you're looking at. So the standards do say where you have historic materials, you need to preserve them. But by historic materials, they typically mean character defining historic materials, not necessarily just old materials. Something to keep in mind when people come to you with projects. Uh, the, the thing, third big thing about the standards is additions. And so two of the standards cover additions, nine and 10. The idea behind these two standards is, and this is the other one that you guys are going to run into most often. If you are doing tax credit projects, this is going to come up a lot. Not with the house that we saw tonight, because it was a pretty big house. But a lot of people who own homes in Littleton have houses that are smaller, and they're going to come to you and say, well, I can't possibly fit, I can't fit all this stuff. My folks had a tiny house. They read like four of us kids in this tiny little house. People come to us now, and they're like, this, 9, 000, this 900 square foot house is too small. And it's like to them and the dog. And it's a little dog. This is too small. They're going to come to you and insist that they need to have a bigger addition. They're going to build additions. So the standards have the last two standards that you want to look at are that if you are building an addition, it needs to be compatible, but it should not match the original. So a lot of applicants and a lot of architects will get this wrong because they will either go with, I'm going to make it wildly different so that you can clearly tell. And what they mean by wildly different is like it's a bungalow with a big metal and glass addition to it. And or I'm going to make it exactly the same so you can't tell the difference, uh, which is the opposite. Um, you don't want either of those. Standard number three cautions people against creating a non-historic appearance. They don't want you to fool somebody into thinking that something you built last year was actually from 1925. Don't want to create that so it's so accurate that you're replicating something that was never there. That could be the case when you're building an addition and you're trying to make it look exactly like the original home, matching the shingles, matching the roof, matching the windows. You want it, I mean, it's kind of a cliche, but tone it down a little is what I often tell people. So if your original windows are uh, six over one, make your new windows one over one. If your original windows have a lot of elaborate trim, put a very simple trim piece around it. Um, have a delineating mark, sort of like between these two tables, there's a little gap here. Have something there to delineate where the original ends and where the beginning, where the addition starts. If you're bashing out the back wall to put a back addition in, leave parts of that back wall intact. Instead of blowing out the entire wall, just widen the doorway so that people can look and say, oh, there used to be a wall here. 
having that having remnants of that is a very important part of the standards in part to avoid the kind of confusion where you do have a thing and you don't know the history of the building and all the evidence of previous changes have been erased by later renovations making it harder to determine what the original house looked like so you don't if you have a project that's going forward, you want to encourage the applicant to not do that because they are also erasing history. Even if that history isn't necessarily the most important thing, that wall is certainly not the most important part of your building, the back wall, but it's important to keep that in place so that that history remains in place. So that's, I think, the three biggest guidance for it. Again, I apologize for not having a, a more exciting um, presentation, although it's full of things that are probably boring. Um, no, that's but interesting. I if really, you guys I, have I questions good. about it, those are the three broad categories of the standards to look at. Um, are there anybody here who is an archaeologist? Yes. So, mm -hmm. Standard number eight is just for you. And you play a really important role. Because standard number eight is overlooked a lot. So standard number eight is the archaeology uh, standard. And it is that if you are doing work on a property, be mindful of the fact that there may be archaeological resources. Archaeological resources, typically we think of it as prehistoric stuff from a thousand years ago. Certainly there are stuff from a thousand years ago here. People have been living here for 5,000 years, so there's plenty of history here. But there's also prehistoric. There's also historic stuff. And historic stuff is defined as since settlement, so since Littleton was founded. Or, or since people started living here, moving in from the east part of the United States and, and settling here, you never know. You find all sorts of things. One of my favorite things is that if you lived in the 19th century and you had to go to the bathroom and you sat there and something fell out of your pocket and it went into the outhouse, it was gone. Granted, that would happen today if you were camping. It falls down there, it's gone. You're never going to see it again until 100 years later when somebody digs it up. So you find just all love privies. You'll find all <laughs> sorts of interesting. You can find stuff in the backyard. Some of it is historic. A lot of it is not. So that's the thing, too, is to keep in mind, not everything that you unearth is necessarily important or historic, but it's something that the standards ask you to keep in mind. That If you start digging for a new foundation, if you're doing significant landscaping, and they come up and they find things, that's an important time to stop, come to you guys, come to you, and say, I found some of this stuff. What do I do with it? Well, that's she, something that doesn't happen in downtown Littleton. I don't know how we go about <coughs> making that happen or encouraging that to happen. That's an issue. I would, it would, thing it we would want to do is mostly be people. encouraging people. Yeah. Uh, mostly. There are some specific laws that if you are doing, um, although it's mostly limited to state or federal land. You are digging on state or federal land and you find things and there are certain procedures with privately owned land. The only thing that really kicks in is if you actually find a bone that might belong to a person, in which case a whole separate sort of things is kept in first and foremost, um, letting the state archaeologist know and possibly the police department. Yeah. <laughs> you never know how old that bone is. Hopefully it's really old. But that's, that's a different can of worms, certainly, but you can... I think people do find archaeology very interesting. Well, we do have things underneath our buildings. The buildings have been here 150 years. So they're, and I know because I've looked at projects that we've dug up things in Littleton just to see if there's anything there. But we had to just figure out from the board when or how we would get involved with that if we have a significant project. But I don't see much of it coming into play right now. For task credits, I think it's mostly just advice. Hey, just so you know. And the thing is, the thing about archaeology, people do find it kind of neat and interesting, and they want to learn more about it. They're always sort of like a little treasure hunt for them. So it is something that you don't necessarily find a lot of pushback on when it's done at the local level, just because it is more of a data recovery in these cases than, right. you know, oh, you can't build here because of blah, blah, blah. Well, I found little toys, little toy men, and like, Half an inch high and painted from the 1960s. Oh, how great! You. And I do. That's really cool. Landscape. It's amazing what I find in my backyard. But you also found find dumps. Yeah. You know there are you know all kinds of dumps that you'll find, and, and some those are fascinating from an archaeological kind of thing perspective. Yeah, and um, they they can be very interesting to to other people in the community, but they're typically not the kind of thing that is, is a showstopper for moving. What fascinates me, though, Joe, about what you were saying is, is that Goldilocks standard of I have a 900 square foot building, I want to put an extra 2,000 square feet behind it somehow, and I have to have 
I have to have it look not radically different, but not radically the same, which seems so subjective. But basically, it sounds like I have to develop the design and then show it to experts, and they can tell me, yeah, that's the Goldilocks standard. It's, it's, it fits in now. You know, there's, there's certainly no, it's a judgment call. It's a, you guys are a quasi-judicial board. You are making sort of gut checks on it. Um, but generally, yeah, if, if it is a 900-square-foot house and it's a 2,000-square-foot addition, that is quite possibly too big. Yeah. And it's going to overwhelm the original house. Uh, or if it's, it's a one-story house and they're putting a two-story addition on it. Well, how visible is that addition from the street? Yeah. You know, Where is the addition located? A lot of people will put additions on the back just because that's the most convenient spot to put an addition. Whether it, the year is 1920 or 2020, that's, that's generally where additions went. But how visible is that from the street? Mm. Uh, extra challenges if you are in a I have a corner lot where it's more visible from the side, uh, or if you're going high, or if you're chopping off part of your original building to build upwards, or a pop top on a bungalow. Those are all things to consider. What is the overall impact on the building and the neighborhood? And the neighborhood if it's in a historic district, which a lot of your buildings are. So how does that affect? visually the neighbors and some of the neighbors are going to come out they're going to be opposed to it they're going to tell you well you can't do this because it's historic neighborhood it's up to you to make that judgment call about whether the applicant can or not um and jason it's not as subjective as you think because when you look at the standard you look at the individual words mm -hmm. which have been gone over and over in detail and tested because i was involved in those testings in the early 80s We'd get together, they'd write the standard, and we'd sit in the meeting and we'd discuss them. Okay. And hundreds of people would discuss them. And not everybody agreed, but we got to a point where if you apply the standard, you end up with a very compatible building. Mm -hmm. But you have to look at each element very carefully and see how that fits into the entire um, overview of the project. Can you think of in downtown, I, I don't want to waste your time, and I know that yeah. we do, but can you think of in downtown a good example of a uh, of an addition that, that meets that standard? There's that garage that's the, the, uh, the Yeah, I don't want to talk about the view house. I think that's an interesting Murals. one. Or murals. Yeah. Uh, I was murals. thinking about murals. Um, yeah. The view house is wild. Yeah, yeah. you have murals. You actually have the tavern, which is a new building within the historic district. Um, I thought we'd talk about these in the future. Um, the board has approved a couple projects. Uh, the old um, Lemke Meat Market, which is where um, something arts is, Ruth's, Ruth's building. But they added on the second story there. Uh, it sits behind. Now, it's different materials. The problem with our downtown Main Street is we've got 100 years of materials. So uh, it gets a little bit more difficult if you go to Loudon Street. Again, all the houses are the same. Mm -hmm. There is one addition on the street which wouldn't have been approved. But, mm -hmm. um, it got in before the district was created. Mm -hmm. But it's not as subjective as you think, but um, it takes a lot of intellectual thinking to get through. And we had some discussion tonight about yeah. standards as well. And um, no, that's well said. Uh, if there, if there, it sounds like in a sense you've got. These are terms of art. In other words, it's not really a, the, the standards of, of long, you know, there's a lot of guidance on how to actually figure out if something fits in. That's, that makes sense. And, and, you know, there is interpretation for sure, and people are involved, but I've added on to buildings and National Park Service, so there's a lot of discussion whether you do that or not, uh, how, you, how you do that. But one thing that Joe is saying, subtle changes in material are really important. The reality is you can't reproduce archaic materials today. You don't even have the craftsmen that can build them. So um, you can get real good for matching the building, but it might take someone with a lot of knowledge and all that it's an addition. A good example of that is the post office. Okay. So look at the post office, because that thing was enlarged tremendously in 1962. Now you can see where the additions were. I could see the additions very clearly on that post office. But would that meet the standards today? That's something I think we should talk about as a board when they add it on to that post office. Um, though that addition has developed its own significance. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's not... A rule of thumb easy. is to put yourself in the footsteps of just random person off the street. Mm -hmm. 
random person off the street saw this project, what would be going through their head? Would they be able to recognize an addition as a new, oh, this was added, if they didn't know, oh, this was added recently, or this was added in the 60s or whatever, knowing that there's a difference between, or so far, are they going to just automatically interpret it as, oh, the building was originally looked this way. You know, that's where you have a successful one. And the flip side is also the case. Are they going to immediately say, oh, wow, that was a great historic building and they added this ugly addition to it? That's not, it's not that the addition is ugly. That's not, it's sin. The addition, the, the problem with that when a person says that is that the addition clearly clashes with the historic building. That's really the thing. So your thing is not, this is ugly. It's that it doesn't meet the standards because it clearly is a mismatch with the original one. It's not complementary. Um, sometimes, certainly, you, you may have dealt with this. We certainly, in designer review, I, I know Denver deals with this all the time where you'll get an architect who will come in and they will say, well, I want to make my mark on this, I don't want to design a building that looks, they'll, they'll kind of throw out a, a fountainhead kind of reference at you, and I don't want to do something that's historic, <laughs> I want to make my mark, and you know what, 50 years from now, you'll be landmarking this edition, because it's so great, uh, you know, the day it turns 50, you'll be rushing in with a landmark to, to put a plaque with my name on it, how awesome it is. It's like, that's not what you're dealing with here, it's not, a, again, it's not a question of whether it is a good edition or a bad addition, whether architecturally it's a masterpiece or architecturally it's a horror show. Those are all subjective terms. The standards are just that. The standards specifically say if you put an addition on a building, it has to be, one, compatible with the original structure in terms of its appearance, and two, something that is could be removed in the future without having to rebuild the rest of the building. And so when you're building additions on now, that, that second one is quite subjective. Technically, everything is reversible. You can always rebuild. We've had buildings that have burned down, and they have rebuilt them exactly the way that they looked. So in theory, everything is reversible. The question is, will it be reversed? If I put something, if I take a one-story building and I put two stories on top of it, well, it's reversible. Is anyone ever going to do that? Probably not. It's probably going to be a three-story building for the rest of time until it gets torn down. So people will come to you and say, well, this is a, I, I'm going to change this, but it's reversible if somebody wanted to. The question to ask is, is anyone actually going to do that? Because if they're not, if this is a major addition to a building, no one's probably going to change it. It's going to be part of the building from now on. So that's where you're really looking at. Some changes are reversible, some changes are not. The standards for additions, standard number 10, does require you to consider, could this be reversed in the future without having to rebuild half the building? And so typically when people will connect, you've seen these additions where it's an addition that's connected by a little uh, kind of an I-shaped thing, or it's off the back of the house, but it's only off the back of the house. And so you're only rebuilding one chunk of the property versus it covers three, sort of looming over it like a tidal wave. Those are the kind of things. The same thing goes for the interior. If you're making changes on the interior, they will often say the same thing. Oh, it's reversible. But are you going to reverse it? If they're going to blow out all the interior walls, because open floor plans are the hot thing right now, and there they've got a living room and a kitchen and a dining room that are all separated by walls. So I'm going to blow all this out, but don't worry, it's reversible. Someone could come along in the future and put those walls in. Is anyone really going to do that? Maybe. You can't guarantee that. You don't even know when that might happen. So those are the kind of things where you say, no, right now the project that's on hand does not meet the standards. And that's why. Always when you do these things, whenever you do these things, when you're taking the standards into account, the important thing is always make sure that you can mention the standards specifically and say why you feel like it doesn't meet the standards. Site specific. It's a critical element of this. Whenever you make a decision, if you're making a decision on a task credit project and you feel like it doesn't meet the standards, <coughs> You would say not just it doesn't meet the standards, but it doesn't meet standard one, three, and six or something along those lines. So you can specifically delineate if they challenge it, it would go to the appeal. So the state won't step in. Uh, I think this was talked about earlier. The state doesn't review your decisions. What your decisions are by law are final. So if you make a decision about a tax credit project, yes or no, that's an automatic yes or an automatic no as far as the state of Colorado is concerned. That's the end of it. But if you say no, the applicant can appeal that decision, uh, and there's a special appeals process for that. <clears throat> and in that case, if they do an appeal, that's where you want to come armed with, this doesn't meet the standards, and here's why. <clears throat> because that's going to be ultimately 
Appeals can only be overturned if the appeals board feels that the project actually does meet the standards. They can't do any other reason. They can't say, this doesn't meet the standards, but it's a really important project for economic development. This doesn't meet the standards, but this is affordable housing, and we really need affordable housing in this city. They can't do that. They have to. If they overturn your decision, it has to be on the basis of the standards. And the same thing goes for you guys. When you make those decisions, it's the same thing. If you're approving it, it's because it meets the standards. If you're not allowing it, it's because it doesn't meet the standards. And it's always good to have that citable so you can say exactly why it does or doesn't meet that. A oh, question. Um, you were talking about interiors. Um, really, we are concerned with building exteriors um, in our historic district. I mean, tonight we were dealing with tax credits, so, right. we, so we were going inside. But typically, we are not invited inside, if you will. Right. And um, so um, as far as this building, if, if we preserved the historic exterior of the building and we wanted to put, you know, um, a roller disco in here, um, like it. We, should be, we should be able to do that. That's correct. So that's, that is an important distinction to make. And it's sometimes a challenge for historic preservation boards. Tax credits cover interior and exterior. Um, almost every designer, pretty much every ordinance in the state is just exterior. Denver has a couple of random ones where they do look at the interior, but those are special cases uh, yeah. based on special circumstances. So even Denver just looks at the exterior. Everyone else looks at pretty much just the exterior. But tax credits are a different animals, so keep that in mind. That certainly you are looking at the interior, you are applying the standards equally to the inside and the outside. Because the typical you know, example would be on a beautiful historic downtown that's perfectly preserved and it's fabulous in every way. And you know, you've got the Calvin Klein store in there that, you know, for their business, they don't want, you know, 19th century stuff. They want the bear box and stuff like that. And But it's on the inside. It's like whatever. Well, you do want to keep it in mind, though, interiors, because there's a disjoint going through into a 19th century facade and seeing a modern interior. Um, if that were the only approach you would do, then all we do is facade saving. But Go to Washington, D.C., where they saved the entire facade. It's very controversial. But it does preserve the character of the street and all that. So there's, there's the balance there. There's the Masonic Temple downtown in, in downtown Denver on 16th Street. You know, that that was just, you know, they were, there were just walls. After the maybe, fire. Maybe, kind yeah, of. After the yeah. fire, yeah. I mean, that, that so. entire interior is completely redone. But, I think when Joe's saying um, keep in mind, like, for tax credits, the importance of both exterior and interior is as, like, an HP. HPB board. So as your board, if you have an applicant who comes and they want to apply for tax credits and um, just keep in mind, like remind them that, you know, you're not reviewing the commercial, like you can say it looks great, but it actually does come to the state for the final say and that there isn't that confusion that we want to rip out all this historic material that's in there that, um, that even as a, yeah, the historic preservation board, you see the exterior, that's what you, you know, have the biggest say, maybe not in the interior, but as the state, if they want those credits, that's yeah. The key. Sarah raises a, a really good point that sometimes pops up um, is that people will come to you and they'll say, "Well, I, I have a store, and it's downtown, and I want to restore the facade, but then I got Calvin Klein who wants to come in, and they they want to change it um, and rip out. They want to expose all the brick or something like that." Um, and you're designing, if you're just coming in for design review, you're going to say, well, okay, because it's going to meet your ordinance. Our ordinance only covers the outside. Problems sometimes run in when they get that okay. People think in their heads that all historic preservations are exactly the same. And so if they get one approval, it's a VIP pass to everything else that is preservation related. Sometimes it'll be the flip side as well, where they'll come in for a tax credit and we'll say it's okay. Oh, this is fine. And they don't think about it. They have to come to you and meet your ordinances. So it's the same thing. People make this mistake all the time. We sometimes run into this. When people come to you first and they say, oh, I'm going to do this stuff, and they don't tell you that they're going to do a historic tax credit, and then they come to us after they've already told Calvin Klein, yeah, sure, you can rip out all the plaster. You can gut the inside of the building. You could put a roller derby rink inside. Um then they come to us and then suddenly they don't get tax credits. And then what they'll say is, but Littleton said it was okay or something like that. So one of the things we are requesting of folks, and this isn't like a, a requirement or anything, but just if you ask people if they're coming to you for design review, if they're also thinking about historic tax credits, does accomplishes two goals there. One, 
it lets them know that there are tax credits available because they might not. And two, it also lets them know that there is a separate the Secretary of the Interior standards that they absolutely have to follow, and those standards are going to cover both the inside and the outside, and that if you are signing off on their design review, you're only saying legally that it meets the requirements of your local design ordinance. That doesn't necessarily mean that it meets the standards, and they do need to be aware of that. So we are asking folks who are certified local governments, if you do run into somebody who's doing, especially I think a commercial project, because you all aren't going to review it, it comes to the state directly, Ask them if they're doing, if they're going to do a renovation in your downtown of a commercial property and they're coming to you for design review, ask them if they're doing historic tax credits or if they thought about it and just letting them know, well, we're not going to review that, but the state is and the state's going to look at your inside and your outside. Well, what I'd like the board to do is think about the buildings downtown that have been remodeled and which ones do you like the best? The ones that have been gutted or the ones where they've saved the interior? Or do you even, even recognize that the interior was saved? A good example is the view house. Yeah. They saved the original roof in the, that building. Now, technically, they wouldn't have had to do that because they had to add a whole lot more structure to get that second floor up there. But they kept that interior <coughs> the building. But the alley, they gutted it. I mean, you go in the alley, it's just blank wall. So look around at the different projects and see how you feel about them. Interiors are important for character. I mean, we, we aren't supposed to deal with them, but from a Preservation standpoint, interiors are important for character. Otherwise, things are really disjointed. And most of our buildings actually have quite a bit of historic material on the inside. And take Murrow's or Palik. I mean, you go inside there. If you know what you're looking at, you can see the gas station. Mm -hmm. You can see yeah. the walls. You can see the thickness of the walls. Um, that's why, you know, we made the argument, or I made the argument, that it was contributing to the district, and everybody agreed. But when you look at that, you can see, because the building is there. Yeah. Uh, and it is a change in use. So it's just, it's not easy to do. Um, I had a question, though, on appeal. I mean, if we, if we approve a project downtown for a tax credit, you said it can be a, you have a review over it afterwards? But and that's what I want to ask. We, as we made a decision, but do you review it? As a certified local government, you are allowed to review residential tax credits. You're not allowed to review commercial okay, credits. Okay, just residential. Okay, yeah. okay. So it's very specific to residential. Okay. The state sets out, and it's because commercial is a first come, first serve based on a limited pool of money. Oh. Okay. Uh, residential tax credits come out of the general fund. Okay. So we can have as many as we want and any order in which we want, uh, and it doesn't affect anything. But the, the tax credits on, this, on the commercial level are out of a specific pool of money that is only $10 million and it doing those relatively fast. So they need to have a centralized place where all the decisions are made in one spot. And that's defined under the statute by the Office of Economic Development. So we really want to encourage residential. I mean, and people should take advantage of their, if they're Absolutely. Yeah. You've got a lot of historic neighborhoods. You have a lot of houses that are now just reaching historic age. I think in particular, as a mid-century kind of boom town, okay. you're now reaching the age where pretty much a lot of your building stock is now hitting that historic 50. Because there is a requirement of law. You do have to be at least 50 years old physically, even if you are a historic landmark before then. In the early, early, early years of Arapahoe Acres, we did actually have a couple of projects that came in before they were 50 years old, but after they were listed on the National Register, and they weren't eligible because they had to meet that 50-year rule. <laughs> but you're going to see more and more of these, and people are going to, certainly there's a housing boom, certainly people are buying these buildings and they're renovating them. This is a good opportunity to reach out to people and say, hey, did you know you're in a historic district? Did you know you can get 50 grand? That's a lot of money for a lot of people. You put it in, 50 grand is a lot for, for an individual tax credit, individual mm -hmm taxpayer, uh, that could easily mean them not paying any taxes for 10 years in a row, which is pretty yeah, attractive. $50,000 is $50,000. It's yeah. nothing to sneer yeah. at. Right? <laughs> well, That's, fortunately, I, we've aged because we did the first survey in 97. A lot of the buildings weren't eligible for that one reason, which I always had issues with. You heard about them. Everybody, Chris certainly has when I was on a review board. Age shouldn't be a determining factor because if it is, why well, have any other factor? But we've passed that. I mean, all the buildings are going to be eligible are over 50 years old in this community. There's going to be a lot of, you're going to see a lot of increasing. Historic tax credits are great because of the fact that it encourages people to do two things. It's not, it's a rehabilitation credit. So it is not requiring them to restore the building 
uh, to its original use. It's not requiring them to restore the building to its original appearance. It's not requiring them to operate it as a house museum. It's designed for them to be able to make upgrades and changes to the property that modernize it, which is what they want to do anyway. When they, everybody who buys a house wants to put their own stamp on it. Um, nobody wants to move into somebody else's house and live in somebody else's house. If you want to do that, you rent. If you want to have do your own, put your own mark on things, you buy the property, you make changes to it. This is a way for us to help protect that by letting people know, look, because a lot of people think preservation, they think house museums. They always do. Always have. Uh, no, you can do renovations. You can make changes. You can build additions to a property. You can make changes to your walls, your ceilings, or whatever within the boundaries of these standards. You... Um, for designer, you only have to do the exterior, but if you want to go the extra mile and you want to get 50000 bucks, which is 50000 bucks, I don't care what inflation is. 50, if someone's like, here's $50,000, you're not going to be like, no, thank you. You're just going to walk away. You're going to be like, ah, oh, 50000 bucks. I can use this. I don't have to pay taxes for 10 years. That's awesome. So it is a powerful incentive. And it's just like, look, it's not a requirement, but if you want to go the extra mile and do this, you're probably going to go the extra mile and do this anyway. You're going to get 50000 bucks for it, so why not? Go for it. Is it going to cost you a little more? It probably is going to cost you a little more to get original materials to put in wood flooring instead of buying the Pergo, to, to, to restore your windows rather than buy whatever gelled one is selling down at Home Depot. It's going to cost a little bit more, but you're going to make that. The whole point of the credit, it's giving you a financial incentive to make up the cost, the extra cost that you spent on restoring the building. You're going to get a better quality building. You're going to like it better, and you're going to, it's basically a free upgrade because you're going to get these credits back. So that's the selling point that we always sell to people. You know, it's a lot of money. Just had to, I had to talk somebody down from the ledge last week. It's a commercial project. It's three hundred fifty thousand dollars in credits, and they were like, "Oh yeah, but I have to pay an." It says I have to have my because you have to have your cost audited when you do a commercial credit. Well, the account's going to cost twelve thousand dollars. I don't want to spend twelve thousand dollars on an account. It's like you're going to get three hundred fifty thousand. So you're going to get 338000 Is that really terrible? You could buy a house with that. Maybe not in Colorado, but somewhere you could probably <laughs> buy a house with that. Uh, we were looking at, just looking at a thing. So that house that y'all were looking at tonight, it sold for $23,000 really? in 1958, <laughs> which is the equivalent of $223,000 counting inflation. Can you imagine that, buying that house for $223,000? Wow. <laughs> it just blows my mind sometimes. <clears throat> but... The selling point of this is that fifty thousand. That is your biggest selling point. Like, look, this is free money. This is yours. You can carry it forward. Even if you sell the property tomorrow, that fifty thousand dollars is still in your pocket. You can still use it. That's the selling point that we use to people. That this is not something where you have to completely restore the property. You can do upgrades to it. You can make repairs to it. We just have these additional guidelines. Take a look at the additional guidelines. If they meet what you think is good, then by all means, jump in and apply. That's really the selling point that we always have. These, these standards are meant to be flexible. There's 10 standards for 450 years worth of building in a country of 330 million people. 10 standards for all of that. For however many microclimates we have in this country, building standards, all of that is covered by these standards. They're specifically meant to be very broad and very flexible, interpreted at the local level. So by all means, that's, that's where our selling point is. There were a lot of mistakes made earlier on. <laughs> And that's how the standards got revised, is these mistakes. What they've also done is they've, re, they've added Ann Grimmer, who has been had worked on her whole life doing the standards because she was involved with the first ones in the last edit in 2017. I thought she'd retired by then. But anyway, look at if you look at the original standards when they were published and then look at what's online now and how much easier it is to read, much more graphics, much simpler language, much sim simpler organization, but the language has not changed. And that's the key, is to, to look at that the language um, in that standard. And CPI always has a, a, a session where they show projects and everybody votes up and down. It's one of the funnest section, sessions they are, do there, whether it meets the standards or not. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's not consensus by everybody in the room. But for the most part, everybody is in that general area. So... Question, clarifying question, kind of in two parts. Um, you talked about interiors and taking out those interior walls is not acceptable according to the Secretary of Interior Standards because who's really going to put them back in those walls? And I agree with that. But then, you know, previously we talked about additions. And one of the criteria is, well, the addition could be removed and you could restore the original house. But who, again, 
who's going to actually remove an addition? And so what's, how do you explain those two? And then my second part is because I've received this question a lot. We have people downtown who would like to remove plaster to reveal, said that exposed brick on the interior. Right. right. And I've, I've said no to that. But I know that other people that I've talked to have said, well, yeah, you could put the plaster back on. Mm. It's just temporary. It's just trendy at the moment. Well, the removing the plaster is very problematic because you aren't going to replace the plaster with plaster. That's the biggest thing. Although standards allow you, if the plaster is damaged, that's the key part of the standards, that if the, if the material is damaged and it can't be repaired and it can't be replaced in kind, then you could put drywall. So there's a three-part test. Were you able to do this? No. Okay. Were you able to do this? No. Okay. You can use drywall. Someone who's tearing plaster off and exposing the brick, not only you're not sure when they're going to put that back, but they're not going to put plaster back. It's going to be way too expensive. The most you're going to get is drywall. And again, while drywall is an acceptable material under the standards, it's only an acceptable material if you didn't start off with plaster in the first place. So that's treatment. That wouldn't meet the standards. Again, the reversibility isn't a good argument there because they're the ones who are causing the damage to it, and they have the opportunity to not do that. So that is the, okay. the biggest thing. If you have the opportunity to do the correct thing and you choose not to do it, and you choose to put that onus on future guy, that's not a, a sufficient answer. The, the old the old comedies get about how I can do whatever I want because it's future me's problem, and I you know today me doesn't have to worry about it. Tonight me can go out drinking all night because tomorrow guy has to go to work. Well, that's that's sort of the idea is that if you're doing, if you have the opportunity to do the correct thing, you can't say, well, I'm not going to do that, but somebody else will in the future. When it comes to that sort of thing, with additions, it's more about the destruction of historic material. I think is what the Park Service is concerned about. Again, the more material you lose in terms of putting on an addition, the more work Future Guy has to do to restore the building, the more expense Future Guy has to undertake to do it, and that further decreases the likelihood of Future Guy actually restoring the building to the way it looks. So you want to be able to encourage people to not bash a huge hole in the wall if a small hole in the wall is sufficient for an addition. If you're going to put it on, put it on the back. Don't put it on the front. Less historic material on the back. Don't blow out the whole wall if you just need part of a wall to move through. There's a lot of temptation to, to build big and to build these huge sweeping floor plans. That's what you want to avoid with that. Again, it's, it's that we don't know if Future Guy exists. We don't know if Future Guy is going to do this work. And we certainly don't want to put the onus on Future Guy to have to do extra work to cover for the sins of current Guy. So that's, that's really how we explain try to explain it to folks. You certainly do get a lot of requests to strip plaster. People will tell you, oh, historically it was brick. The answer to that is 99.9% .9 no. Um, the whole idea of I want a basement chic kind of thing is certainly a new thing. Um, people really like, to the point where like people who lived in, in uh, log cabins would just would tack up newspaper if they didn't have anything else available so that they had something to look at besides logs uh, just to have some kind of covering. Uh, because it was seen as that was sophisticated. You lived If you lived in a brick building, you were unsophisticated and unhip. You were a room. You would actually have those walls plaster finished. You'd have stuff imported from East or the Midwest to put on there, cast iron storefronts, uh, plate glass windows, interior furnishings. People would even ship for saloons and things. They'd ship <coughs> the entire 40-foot bar. It would come on a railroad and sure hold it on a wagon and shove it in the building because of the idea that you wanted that. So you will run into it a lot all the time. I've seen hotel people do it. That is certainly not. Who's going to stay in a hotel with brick walls in 1885? Nobody. It Maybe today, but not back then. Store owners, um, homeowners, yeah. apartment dwellers. Unless it was, unless you can demonstrate that it was like a factory or a warehouse, it was probably plastered. Yes. I don't want to keep you guys too long. I know it's getting late. Anybody else? Yeah. Sir, I have to drive back to Lyman. So you, you guys have been very patient. Oh, Lyman? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, my, my apologies for bringing the wrong homework today. Definitely misread that email. <laughs> <laughs> Our bad. Very bad. No, but this was good. This is well, great. Thank you. Sometime in the future, we'll, we'll have another study session where we'll pick about five projects in Middleton, and we'll just go through them and see. Sounds great. If you want, we can also do a walking tour. Sometimes we'll find oh, yeah. handy. If you'll want to like, kidnap us and drag us around town. That's, that would be Oh, no, don't well, we would, drive around It's a public meeting, and we can't do that, so you have to do it here. With okay. it's, not a, it's not a can't, Rick. 
Oh, it's very you hard. You can't do that. We just happen to sh all show up at the same <laughs> corner at the same time. <laughs> but walking through would be good, but we could also do it here. I mean, I've got, I've identified about five buildings With slides, that would be of yeah. interest mm -hmm. to, to look at. Just talk about it. View House would certainly be one. Murrow's would be one. Well, Rick, we can also do something along your line because it is kind of a fun thing to do to, to have that are the random one. projects, put it up on the wall. The feds still do this, in fact, although one of them was ours once and it was, so it was a national meeting and it was one of our projects and it didn't meet the standards. There were, you know, myself and my colleague were like, mm, I don't know, it's my meet the standards. I could think a couple of Thankfully, everybody ones. else hated it, so it made me feel better. But, you know, that's a great idea to have that sort of, here's some random photos of things, here's an addition. Do you think this addition meets the standards? Why or why not? Uh, here's a treatment to the inside. This person replaced all their windows. Should they have replaced all their windows? Are the new windows appropriate or not? I, we've got plenty of it. We've done so many of these projects. We've got plenty of examples. So that is actually a really great idea. I would love to do that in a future study session. And I'm curious about um, mid-century modern. <laughs> Just getting particularly commercial because that's a much more difficult issue to deal with. And maybe if you guys have, have some projects you've looked at, maybe bring you back down just to talk about the mid-century modern. As we get into Littleton Boulevard, which three quarters of the buildings that were surveyed are eligible for landmarking or higher. So, and we know change is gonna occur there. We've lost four buildings in the last five years already on the street, and there's more change coming. So, it's a concern for all of us because we can't, <clears throat> can't get a district there because of the way the street's laid out. You know, so. Well, we want to we'll start educating people on the importance of shag carpeting and avocado green. And there you go. Yeah, yeah, avocado green's coming back. We're almost there. It so, um, <laughs> certainly on mid century materials, and just it, you know, because mid century materials have taken a wrap for so long, and some of it is deserved some because it, it wasn't, a lot of it wasn't well thought out. Uh, you know, the, the question of carpeting came up earlier tonight, and that was the thing where people would sometimes, oh, wall-to-wall -wall carpet is so luxurious because they had up until that time thought of carpeting as like a rug that you yeah. bought at a rug store and it cost a ton of money, just as, just as much as it cost now. It also cost that much back then to buy an oil rug, spread it out. So the idea that you could have something soft under your feet and it didn't cost that much was amazing. It was just so elegant that it was wall-to-wall. I mean, that was a huge selling point. But then they learned about the bad sides about it. It wore yeah. out, that it discolored things that didn't happen to wood things. You know, you can you can spill stuff all day on a wood floor and it's not that bad. You spill, you got one kid in one 1970s cup of Kool-Aid and suddenly and your white carpet is permanently ruined. So that was the, the flip side of it. So it is, they've taken kind of a bad rap. People are like, I don't want carpeting. I want wood floors because carpeting is blah, blah, blah. And so that can be sometimes just as challenging for us today to convince people to use mid-century materials as it was for people in the mid-century to convince people to use turn-of-the-century things. So things, the more they change, the more they stay the same. But again, we're happy to, to walk you through that as well, because that is certainly, for a lot of places in Colorado, it's an immediate pressing issue of trying to reserve mid-century materials from people who, who right. would rather throw them away. Well, that carpet made my house about $25,000 more valuable since it went on about five years after the house was built with my nice wood floor, which I know it was on for a few years because you can see the high heel marks. <laughs> and that's refinished. Today, to put a floor like that is $25,000, $30,000 for my house, which is 700 square feet well, of wood. So if you get the wood, that's the other thing. Anyway, all right, Joe. If there's no other questions, if Joe or Sarah, Sarah. Lyman, my gosh. Thank you. Play my husband. <laughs> But. Well, we'll invite you down again. Maybe we'll, we'll invite you down again and maybe do a walking tour if we can. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, very, very thank you. Very informative. Thank you both. Thanks, guys. Thanks. 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 Before you leave, we have cake for Andrea. Yay! Yay. Yay. There's always room for cake. All righty. Um, Keep you awake on that drive. Time of adjournment is 9.38 p.m. Can I head out? All right. That's so yeah.